Hello, and welcome to Elevate. I'm Randy Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, Elevate is a show bringing you in-depth interviews with top experts in the world of human potential and behavior. My hope with this show is that you take what you learn and you apply it and you do something with it. Communication is one of the most important elements of life. Without it, well, we're simply alone. And the part of communication that we likely know the least about is what happens when we're not talking. Today's guest is here to shed some light on the impact of body language. Born and educated in England, a background in theater and movies, he worked as a cultural attache for the British Council in Tel Aviv, also an associate director on Seven Days, worked as an advisor to the Arts Council of Great Britain, author of four books, and founder of an organization called Truth Plane. A great pleasure to welcome world-renowned language and body expert, uh, Mark Bowden. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here today. Great to be here, Randy. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I, I'm always fascinated uh, first to learn about the messenger. So if we can, let's, you know, let's start there. What, uh, what's the screenplay uh, of this life of yours that, you know, I don't think you were born, you know, as this world renowned expert, something happened along the way. So take us back through your story and, uh, you know, what led to this fascination of, uh, you know, body language. Beautiful. Well, the film opens on a cold beach uh, on England, uh, on the coast of England, where uh, a little blonde haired boy, which is myself, is playing in rock pools and looking at the biology, the sea life that gets left as the sea comes out and wondering, uh, you know, why uh, organisms move as they move? Like why we're, why the earth is in this this manner, why the natural world is as it is and what any of that might mean. And so as a kid, I was fascinated with movement as a good generalization and then fascinated with visual imagery, how images change people's minds. I got pretty good at constructing images and pretty good at biology as well. And I think the two things came together in that I got fascinated with specifically human movement and the evolutionary psychology around that. Uh, worked and studied in those areas and visual art, went into theater, film, TV, worked in those areas, then went into politics and business, worked with CEOs, prime ministers, helping them move in certain ways that would get a specific result out of the constituents or the um, the uh, the um, kind of shareholders, um, the stakeholders that they needed to have an effect on. Uh, and and it's continued from there, really. Looking back at this, and I, and I know that you had a pretty considerable, uh, you know, career in uh, in theater and film and and the rest of it. And when you were on that beach, too, by the way, how how old you started becoming fascinated by this? Because I've always believed that you know, in the early days of life, things come to the fore, and if we pay attention to them, as you did that starts to you know take direction to bring you to where you're supposed to be in life how old yeah so that that little boy on the beach is seven eight years old wow i would say yeah fascinating do you do you kind of subscribe to that theory you know for uh for people that are listening and maybe you know some things to tell their kids to you know to pay attention to those those signposts early on in life well i i i think people can change so, so, I, so I don't think that we are absolutely molded by our earliest experiences. I think we can be, but we don't necessarily have to be. We can change. We can decide uh, a life for ourselves, which, uh, you know, within certain circumstances, which is different from how we started out. I would say, um, though, th when we think about why we've ended up, how we've ended up, we'll always look back in the past and try and make sense of it. Right. So it could be a bit, be a little bit of both. It could be me making sense of of that, and it could be that it was a massive impact. So all of these, you know, all these elements of your of your background, theater and film and business and uh, the arts and and all of these things. Was there something? You know, again, you know, hindsight is a great place to pull up a chair uh, to to look back on your past and say, this is when I really started to notice that this was the space I was belonging in, that I was getting really good at this. And now I'm going to make that a career. Yeah, I think there was. And again, it was when I was quite young. Um, 
I was not great at some aspects of school. I'm dyslexic, so I was really didn't um, feature well when it came to reading, writing, um, and and mathematics. I, I mean, I knew how to do it all actually incredibly well, but it didn't translate to the way that uh, the teachers and the people marking that work would like it to turn out. And so it was quite frustrating because I couldn't really succeed. And then I remember once um, uh, the school were doing uh, visual freezes of, of uh, scenes from Alice in Wonderland to be put outside classrooms as a kind of a school project. And I got, what the teacher did is to say, hey, Mark, you don't really have to do the lessons that we're doing at the moment because you can just go outside and build that for us. So you can do, you can be responsible for that. So I, I realized that if I stuck to visual imagery, I could not fail in the classroom. I, I could ex succeed massively if I focused on that. So it was really a sense of if I stick to visual imagery, I don't have to suffer the pain of failure and I can get some of the rewards of success. It's really interesting that you bring that up. We're going through a situation with our daughter right now as far as really, you know, trying to define she's in grade eight now about to go into high school and trying to define how she learns, mm. um, had her tested very high IQ. Uh, but there's some it, it's so interesting in listening to this conversation. And I hope uh, a lot of people will take this to see what kind of success comes from someone with, you know, self-identified early struggles that. Mm. It sounds like that you were able to fill in a lot of gaps um, through visual learning. Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, I ended up doing my my university dissertation on uh, Jungian psychology and the Muppet show. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a natural. I mean, who hasn't, right? Of course. <laughs> you know, as most people do. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, and it was you know, just out of interest. <laughs> it was looking at the character of Kermit and 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 Jung's idea of the shadow. Anyway, um, <laughs> there was one very important thing that Jim Henson said, and he and he put it in the mouth of Kermit the Frog, uh, and he said, "Take what you've got and fly with it." Which was really the Muppet Show. It was people who were yeah. the characters of the Muppet Show are utterly useless. They're right. terrible, but they have one skill. One skill that if they if they go with that skill, life gets a whole lot better for them. Certainly, it's a lot more fun, and they move through the day, and they have friends, and they and they get to the end of the day, and it's a great you know they put on a show, and it's a great show. Okay, they've entertained people. You know, they've kept going in life, and so I've really taken that that Henson idea to to heart and gone look, what is it that you've got? Like focus on that focus on that and fly with that and some of the other stuff that yes maybe you need or other people think you need it'll just fall by the wayside it'll it'll be okay when when was it that you know you started to identify i mean you're you're very articulate you're, you're a very good speaker you're a professional speaker now i mean obviously you got years of doing this but when was it that you started to notice wait a second it's not just what i'm saying it's the expression, it's the body language, all of that is really, you know, a major element that enhances the message. When, when did you start, you know, kind of feeling that this is really important? Well, I, I, w I was studying visual theater and, and we had techniques and exercises and demonstrations that could show exactly how you could distort what, what somebody said in somebody's mind by putting different visual images with it. I mean, massively distorted. You could cause people to believe something was said that wasn't said. You could get them to verbate, say, hey, what did that person just say? And get a verbatim description out of them as to exactly what that person had said. And you know they said the opposite but you'd shown them the body language that would distort that in somebody's mind. And at that point, I went, it doesn't matter what somebody's saying unless the body language is congruent. And I can completely distort what they've said in somebody's mind with incongruent body language. So, you know, 
I could have a lawyer <laughs> write down, you know, listen to something and go, this is what the person said. Okay. I yeah. could then get a public to watch and listen and get them to write down what was said. And they'd say what was said was the opposite. So hang on, we've got factual, we've got fact. Right. And then we've got all of the people going, no, that wasn't what was said. Well, that's powerful. That's incredibly powerful, especially when you come to politics. Now it's now it's dangerously powerful, and so and so you start thinking, well, you know, who who um, who should know about this? Because there might be you might have a great message out there, but you can't get it across. Everybody thinks you're saying the opposite of yep. your great message. They could have a terrible message over there, terrible but everybody thinks they're delivering a great message. So let's look let's look at a couple examples of this and I know mm -hmm. that uh, we'll, we'll get to Stephen Harp in in, uh, in a moment and I know that you did some work with him. Um Donald Trump. Yeah. So, you know, armchair from your position, you know, coming down that escalator um and pretty much insulting three quarters of the world on his route to, you know, towards the White House. Did you, you know, I mean, you must have been so fascinated by this and he was very, you know, emoting with his with his body. What was he doing, do you think, that helped to take of such an unlikely candidate and, and put him in the number one position in the world? Well, no, first of all, he was recognizable mo straight from moment one. Right. When you put him up on that road to the White House and you I think I remember, you know, there were there was him and about 12 other people in one in one debate where they kind yeah. of lined everybody up and gone like, you know, here's here's who we would put forward as a as a as a, can, a party candidate. Well, there was there was only really two of them, I would suggest that were absolutely recognizable that the brain instantly goes, oh, I know what we've got here. Right. Know what we've got here. Well, number one, be recognizable. And he put in the work beforehand on that. He was already a celebrity. He was already a star. Already a guiding light. Now, not necessarily the guiding light for everybody, okay? And, and I certainly wouldn't agree with a great deal of, of what he what he said. But do I remember what he said? I remember the key things. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. I remember two. You know, two, in many ways, he had he had one message too many because you only need one, and he had two that really stuck. So maybe he was gambling three a, a, a bunch of different messages and going, let's see which one really really sticks. But if I ask anybody on the planet and they go, oh Donald Trump, you know, oh, I didn't like that, and you go, so what was he saying? They'll go, he was saying, make America great again. Or they'll say, he was saying, build a wall and make them pay. And crooked Hillary. <laughs> crooked Hillary. That, okay, that was, that was Yeah, that was another that great was one, the so. third. Crooked Hillary, yeah. But, but really. his, his body language, though, when, you know, you would see him speak on stage and he would walk out and he just, you know, exuded confidence. And, you know, he would walk around and point at people mm -hmm. so intentionally and he would clap for himself and... Analyze that for us and, you know, forgetting the messenger, what was he doing right? Okay, so so um, he was up in passion. So he was up at chest height. When, when you gesture up in chest height, especially when you're symmetrical, people join in with that passionate idea because their breathing rate increases and their heart rate increases. Yeah, so you can get people excited simply by putting your hands up at chest height. He was doing um, very detailed gestures with his fingers, with his hands, yeah? Right. yeah, gestures that are quite difficult for the brain to do. Yeah. So we start to think he's smart. In fact, he'll say smart and do very tactile. Yeah. A genius. Uh, yeah. Actually, yes. a genius. Yeah. 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 A genius. Yeah. Uh, he'll he'll and, and use his fingers. Yeah. In a very delicate, you know, pinch like gestures or OK gestures or LOK gestures. So Again, you're you're doing so much of this now. And I you know, I'm watching you and I and I'm fascinated. And I'm sitting here like a stick and I uh, 
I'm, I'm assuming you're not thinking about this. You've done this so long. This is just, am I, tell me if well, I'm wrong. I've, it's I've, just I've, become I've, part I've, of who you are. I've shown people uh, the gestures that Trump was using such a lot. <laughs> okay, all right, okay, them. fair enough. But yeah. I just want people to know, I, everybody try, try and do the, the A-OK, uh, the OKL gesture, right. and you'll find it's actually quite hard to do. You have to practice it right. in order to do it. It takes some brain power to do it. And, and, and the audience's brains know that. They go, oh, that's a smart person. Look how they're using their fingers. No, I mean, it's just practice, just like right. a pianist yeah. would practice. Now, he's also he also will use asymmetrical gestures, and he'll change the horizontal height that he uses those as well. That's to confuse you. So we'll talk about other people's policies. He'll talk about Hillary. He'll talk about all of that, and you'll get confused. And then he'll go to symmetry. And then he'll right. deliver his message. And it means you pay attention to his message. His message seems clear, uh, assured. Other people's messages seem confusing. It's very clever. You're it, not, it's, you're not yeah, thinking it is. you part timer. I, I think my first question when I, you know, uh, found out that uh, we we're going to be able to get you on the show was, you know, in thinking about this and looking at this, and I'm, you know, I'm watching videos of you and hearing some of this, and my, my first thought was. Uh, okay, but we haven't been a civilized uh, organization forever. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we did live in caves and we, you know, evolved. And so nature nurture, how does that play into it? And what happens specifically with the Italian culture that they seem to be? So talk, talk to that. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. Okay. So, um, so if you go to places on the planet which are closer to the equator but not too close and they have just the right amount of water in them, uh, it's easier to live there, okay? It's easier yeah. to live. Uh, resources way more abundant. You can then develop languages that, you, that take way more syllables per unit of meaning because your brain isn't searching around for the basics of food and water you know, and, and fruits and vegetables and meats, and they're really abundant simply because of the place on the planet where you have gone to and you've protected. So in, in, um, in certain parts of what now is, is Europe, the, um, the Greek and Italian, the, the Greek and Latin languages were, were evolved. And those languages use more syllables per unit of meaning than many other languages. So, for example, my English language is a, a grouping of the, the of of Greek and and Roman uh, Latin, but also uh, German, uh, which come which German comes from a very cold part of the planet, right? You know, and so and so German will use uh, not many syllables per unit of meaning. So, for example, um, uh, if I say if I need some water, um, please may I have water. Yeah, look, all all single syllables apart from water. Yeah, I could I could instead of water I could go. Please may I drink? Yeah. Now, if you try and say that in French or Italian or Greek, you will use up so much more time than if you say it in English. So so clearly those languages come from a place where you're not so desperate because you've got time. All right. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. 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 Now, here's the other thing is the part of your brain that does language, the Broca's area, is actually very, very close or, 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 at the, or, or um, actually very, um, takes up the same brain space as uh, the part of the brain that does the motor area of the, of the fingers and the hands. So in order to promote a complex language, you end up moving your hands more in order to get all the syllables out. Right. Okay? It helps with a Latin language if is you move your hands. Is it a pacing issue for them? Uh, it's, it's actually getting the brain to kind of spark up right. and, and, okay. and produce the language. Now, add to that, as you go further towards the equator, you want to lose heat. Raise your arms up, you'll lose heat from underneath the armpits. 
So now you go to Italy, you've got a language where people are gesturing with their hands more because there's more units of, there's more meaning, uh, there's, there's, there's more syllables per unit of meaning, and they're trying to lose heat at the same time. Now you've got somebody speaking, you know, in that body language Italian with you. Fascinating. So, so again, so a child grows up in Italy, yeah, right? uh, and the child is born. Yeah, um, are they mimicking their parents, or are they? Is this you know partially for them in aid as well? Yeah, it's partially in aid, and they're mimicking their parents. Um, if you if you get if you get a um, an Italian child to to you know they, you tie their hands down by their sides and get them to speak, you'll find that they're not producing. <laughs> they'll produce right. more simple words. Right. So, you know, uh, we, we as you know, English speakers would do the same. Put put their hands put their hands down by their sides, and they'll they won't come up with with many of the more complex Latin derived words. They'll go more to the Germanic ones. I I remember I talk about this often. Uh, John Stewart on the Daily Show years ago had a guest on, and he was Canadian. They were talking about Canada Day, and. Uh, John Stewart said, you know what, just imagine all those years ago, right? There's these two groups of guys uh, and they're standing around and they're having this conversation. And finally, one group says, no, 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 it's fine. We'll take the frozen part. <laughs> and so right. Uh, right. I, I think that if it would have been different, we may be gesturing more, uh, you know, as a born and bred Canadian. Maybe that's why we're, you know, stick, stick like that. And um, well, if you go up, if you go up to the very, very cold north where the Inuit are, when they stand around and talk to each other, okay, they will they will get in a very close group, very close group to sh to shade each other from the wind and the cold, right? You know, uh, um, way more, um, way way less uh, syllables per unit of meaning uh, there. And also, also multiple words to describe, you know, things like snow, because because we'll start to produce more descriptions of things which are most important to us. You know, up there, snow isn't just snow. There are so many different types because you need to know the different types right. in order to survive. So Stephen Harper and the case study there. Uh, I'm a you know I'm a I'm a closet a political junkie and you know, follow all the major politicians. And I always play the games of who I think is going to win the next, uh, you know, the next election. But Stephen Harper, here's someone who was, you know, completely a policy wonk. Very, very bright guy. Canadians, you know, don't really give him enough credit for keeping Canada out of the subprime mortgage crisis, you know, and 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 kept our country much healthier than the U.S. Uh, in going through that. But I think that his demise in, in large part was, you know, was his personality. Now you worked with Stephen, so you know whether it's Stephen or someone like him. What are the kinds of things that you you know kind of identify with people who need to you know uh, emote more with body language, and how do you get them to bring their words more to life? Mm. So, so with politicians, it's it on the whole, it's just relatively simple, which is open body language. Just be more open, more of the time. Be more symmetrical more of the time be seen show more of your body more of the time because the instinct will want you to be seen less the instinct will want you to cover up more the instinct will want you to protect yourself more so you end up having to do uh the the opposites on the whole of what you think you should do the instinct will want you to go asymmetrical because you're you wanting to get across complex ideas whereas what you really need to do is simplify the message simplify the body language go symmetrical uh go open uh speak generally in what i would call the truth plane which is open palm gestures at navel height do way more of that. So it's it's on the whole, at the very base level, it's pretty much as simple as that. And you might go, well, that's really, that must be really easy to get them to do. Well, no, it's actually really hard work because their instinct wants to do all kinds of other stuff. And also, does, does part of that come from, you know, this desire to be seen, you know, a, a, as an intellectual uh, and not be really demonstrative, you know, on stage in a presentation in front of their, uh, you know, their, their, their team and, and the rest of it that they're, they think that they're there for the message. And so they, you know, they're very 
stoic and very, you know, kind of corporate in the presentation. Well, they're, they're confused because because there's all <laughs> kinds of there's all kinds of audiences for them. Right. There's there's their party, so they're constantly in a battle to stay in control of their their party. Yeah, um, they're constantly in a battle to stay in control of of their parliament. They're constantly in a battle to stay in control of their cabinet. Uh, then there's the people. Okay, and, and let's just take Canada. What you need to understand about Canada is over the last number of elections, certainly as long as I can remember over the last, so I've been in Canada about 17 years, Okay, every leader has been voted in by around, let's just say roughly 35% of the voting public voting for that prime minister. Most people don't like the prime minister that's voted in. Right. Most people have never voted yeah. because because there's a system of first past the post and not proportional representation. So therefore, you're there as the leader, and here's what you know: most people don't like you. It doesn't matter whether you're Justin Trudeau or Stephen Harper. Most people are going, "That's not the one I wanted," and yet that's the one in charge because of the system. So so you put yourself in that position and go, "Okay, most people don't like me. I'm in." I'm still in competition with people who want my job and want to oust me. And they're all over the place. And, and where they are is closest to me. My, the person I think is my biggest ally is probably the one that's going to stab me in the back eventually. <laughs> right. Yeah. That is a high risk place to be in. And now you're trying to run a country and there was no education for that. So, well, and then, you know, and then it boils down to the democratic process where 40 percent of the people don't even bother to vote. You know, here in Canada, 130,000 people gave their lives so we would have the opportunity sure. for you and I to have this conversation and to go and vote people into office. And 40 percent of the population on federal elections don't even bother to show up. Uh, and so, you know, we I, I just think the entire political system should in some way, I think Australia does it where it's mandatory to vote. Um, and, and I think that uh, I actually ran politically back in 2000. And one of the things that I believe in is that um, it, it is our God given right uh, to have a democratic country and we need to vote. And I think that uh, writing a, a basic civics test should be tied to your driver's license because, yeah. you know, that people just don't know what they're voting for. Yeah. But, you know, if you want my opinion, the first thing I would do is to move the system out of proportional rep uh, out of out of first past the post to proportional representation. Our current prime minister said um, on his first election that he would do that. He said this would be the last first past the post election that Canada would ever see. But the turkeys don't vote for Christmas. So because the system that you got in on is not the system you'll get in on the next time around. So he he nixed that idea. But then. Uh, every prime minister that I've ever seen that has said they will do that, never do that. It's very disappointing. So major name recognition. Here's here's another great example. So um, Justin Trudeau, you know, obviously, you know, coming coming into uh, into the world on, you know, on uh, the coattails of his dad uh, now being in power for some time hasn't really been challenged all that much until perhaps. And I wanted to ask you from a body language standpoint. How do you rate him uh, and the new conservative leader? How do you rate Pierre Polyev on his on their body language? Yeah, look, you know, both of them have have, have learned that uh, they need to be symmetrical. Both of them have learned that they need to be clear with their uh, their gestures. So they're both doing quite well. Uh, you know, obviously Trudeau has had more time uh, in that leadership position to get used to the stress that's going on there. And understand, look, you know, a, 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 a leader only has a shelf life of, of so long anyway. So, you know, often when you're trying to get elected in, you're not looking at how strong you are, you're looking at how weak they are at the moment. Uh, because, you know, Harper losing to, um, to Trudeau was probably more about Harper than it was about Trudeau. Probably right. more about he'd already done, what, 12 years or something like that? Certainly 10, which is about you're getting onto your maximum the there anyway. Life, yeah. doesn't matter who you are. The public are going to go, well, that's getting old, isn't it? 
So look, you know, from somebody who works with politicians, what I'm often looking at is not who this person is, but but who the opposition is and what we can capitalize on in terms of how they're failing rather than how this person is succeeding, right. essentially. So look, you know, you know, Trudeau's main nonverbal problem at the moment is time. He's been there a long time time and so and so how do you capitalize on that non-verbal problem which is the length of time that people have seen you in that position and what they're making up in their head about that length of time now if i were if i were working with his team i'd be trying to countermeasure that non-verbal proposition yeah right. by going now's not the time you know now's not the time to change do you, from time to time, and it's, you know, it's interesting, I'm kind of sitting here wondering uh, what you, you know, what you're seeing in me. <laughs> uh, and again, I'm, you know, a, a true Canadian and sitting here very, you know, very you know, static and, you know, delivering the message. But uh, in knowing as much as you know, are there times where, you know, someone in politics, someone in the public, someone, you just reach out and say, uh, could I talk to this person? I would love to be able to, to you know, is there is there part of your career you just can't help yourself sometimes? Never. Never. I never, no. I never say, hey, I think I could be helpful. Could you put me in contact? Never. Because it puts you, because the work that you have to do with somebody, especially a leader who has a lot of power and therefore is under a lot of stress and is trying to find ways to to bat off good help. You know, right. they're trying to, because the good help will be highly critical. So they have to come to me because otherwise they won't do what I'm telling them to do and they won't accept the criticism. They just won't accept it. So, um, so I'll often have people who go, oh, I have the ear of, you know, I'm, I'm helping you know, politician X or leader X. And I think they could do with your help. And I'll go, yeah, great. Fantastic. I'm very open to it. Um, you know, so would you come in and have a talk to them about that? It's like, no, you're going to have a talk to them about that. You're going to convince them first of all, and then I'll come in and start the work. Right. But I'm not, I'm not going to come in and do some kind of dance you tell them about my track record, you tell them who I've worked with, you show them the results that I've got, and they're either in or out. It's just too hard. If they're not in, it's just too hard. It's just and, no you know, and a waste uh, of everybody's time. Again, I think that we're, we're in such a magic pill world, you know, that people are, you know, really looking for that quick snapshot. And, you know, all people used to read books, you're a, you know, multi book writing author, and uh, now they want it all to get, you know, from a blog. So, if you sat down and you work with someone and and I hired you and said, okay, so I, uh, I, I really want to work at this and I want to get better at this. What's the commitment? What's the time frame, And what are the expectations? I think that's so important for people to, to know uh, we're not going to change their lives in this hour, right? But we'll whet their appetite in something that they can start to learn more about. Well, look, we, we could, we could change somebody's life in an hour. I mean, you could do it in minutes, Okay. But you have to, you have to want the change. You have to want the result. So first of all, the conversation that we're going to have is with a politician, for example, do you really want to win? How much do you want it? What are you prepared to do to get it? Yeah. What are you prepared to do to get it? Are you prepared to change to get this? Because, because some of them aren't, they're like, actually, I'm quite, I'm quite happy. I, I don't want to do anything more. I don't want to take any more risk. I don't want to push myself in any other direction. I they don't want it that much. <laughs> yeah. And like so Steve Martin said, you gotta wanna, right? Oh gosh, you've yeah. got to you've got to want it because I will say, look, I will do with you everything that is necessary, anything that is necessary to get you this, but you've got to you've got to want to do it as well. Okay, so there's number one, you got to want it. And then you've got to do you've got to say, will you do as I tell you? 
Yeah, will you do as I tell you? And not just on Saturday, will you do it on Monday morning, Tuesday morning, all day Thursday, all day? Because we've got to make sure that the media only get the pictures of you we want them to get. We're going to propagate an image of you that if they want anything else, they have to go back to old stock. And so they're going to use, if they want to show you as anything else than we want you to be seen, I want you to be seen, they will have to show old pictures. And people will go, that's an old picture of them. Why didn't you take a picture of them today when they were making the speech? And the media would go, because they weren't showing an image that we wanted them to show because we've got right. a bias. We're, yeah, yeah. I know what bias the media has, okay? And I'm not going to let them have the images or the words that fit that bias. I'm going to have to, I'm going to cause them to distort and lie in order to give the public the image that they want, which means my person, my candidate has to do what I need them to do 24 seven. So you can't get any other images. It, it really strikes me. And I've been studying the science of human behavior my entire life. And it really strikes me that when you sit down and you work with someone, A, you need to identify, they have to have the drive and then B, in order to implement and adopt what you're asking them to do, you're really asking them to become really uncomfortable. Is that true? Yeah. You're, yeah. you're breaking. I mean, the guy might be 56 years old. He's been, you know, been doing, he was Stephen Harper for 56 years. And then yeah. you asked him to be a brand new guy. And that's, yeah. that's uncomfortable. True. I had, I had one, one prime minister say to me, I won't tell you what I was asking them to do. And, but, but they said, uh, I can't do that. They'll make fun of me in the house. I can't do that. They'll make fun oh. of me. And they were right. He was right. He was right. They, they would make fun of him in the house. I can't do that. They'll make fun of me. And I said, you're a, you're a big boy now. <laughs> you're wearing <laughs> long pants. You're, it's okay. You're a big you can boy do this, now. Yeah. You're going to go out yeah. and, and do it. And they will make fun of you. But we don't care about them. They don't have the power. The people have the power and the people want to see this and you're going to show them that all the time. So yeah. you're asking people to go through, you know, a pretty substantial behavioral shift. So hmm. um, you start working with someone like a Stephen Harper, who is not, you know, a demonstrative person. What would you say is kind of a, a realistic timeline to start to become comfortable with doing something that you're making them do in the beginning that feels so weird? The timeline is never. They will never be comfortable with they it. They won't? No. When do they get good at it? When oh, can they get good like, at it? Like it depends how, depends how focused and, and, and smart and in control of their body they are. So how control in control they are. Um, but, but I've never met anybody at that level who, who doesn't have a level of smart and control. Like they are, they didn't get there by, sometimes it looks like accident and there is some serendipity and some like, wow, that was lucky right. going on. Yeah. But you don't, in my experience, you don't get on that trajectory without some elements of being able to control certain things. Yeah. And so when, when I say, look, here's what you're going to do. It's super simple. Do it for me right now. Yeah, you're doing it. Good. You're going to do that 24-7. Yeah, that you know they're able to do it. They're able to do it, and and uh, they've said, "Yes, Mark." I've had one go, "Yes, Mark." I'm going to do that all the time now, and I've said, "I know you are. I know you are," and and you've seen it. It's like they're doing it all the time. They're doing it now. You you have to sh you have to show them how effective it is. Like they have to buy into it. You can't give. Well, them, I mean, that's what I was going to ask. Is once you teach someone something. And, you know, these are busy people and they're in a lot of meetings and they're on stages and they're giving presentations and speeches and the rest of it. And then they apply, um, you know, some of the elements of what you're talking about. What's their reaction back to you uh, as far as what they noticed of, about the people in front of them? Oh, it's, like, it's night and day. They're just like, this is brilliant. It works. So they get it. People they are saying different like stuff that. about me. You read yeah. it in the papers. Right. You, you see you see journalists writing what you're wanting them to write about the, and they can't help it that you'll get journalists going I, you know I, I never thought I'd say this but I know, just this saw person this. looks yeah. prime ministerial right 
say, of course they do. Of course they do, because I know the images that you need to see in order for your brain to go, that is a prime minister. And I'm only showing you those images and I'm not letting you see anything else other than that. Yeah, so I'm really controlling the meaning in people's in people's heads. I'll be honest, for me, this is just uh, opening up volumes uh, of thoughts and questions and starting to identify and realize things in life. Let, let me ask you this. Uh, business is always what you get hired for, uh, you know, typically, you know, yeah. in uh, in this world. But this is something that applies to being a human being. And I was just thinking about this in terms of, you know, social and family and the rest of it. What about introverts? Um, are introverts created because, and I'm just wondering, this is just, you know, coming out of my mouth, but are, are they created because they have been going through life and they're not good at this? And so because they're not getting reactions, it causes them to withdraw. Yeah. So look, let, let's let's just kind of pass out what the difference is between an introvert and somebody who, who is asocial, which, which is a, a, a word we would use for just they're shy. So in my mind, an introvert is somebody who thinks before they speak. An extrovert is somebody who thinks while speaking. Right. So an extrovert will tend to take up more space in terms of um, their gestures uh, and and their conversation, and because as they speak, they're actually thinking. Yeah. So, for example, in this situation here, I have to be extrovert because I don't really know the full answer to this question right now. I'm speaking and thinking at the same time. This right. is extrovert. And people might go, wow, you know, Mark's great at these interviews because, look, he's extrovert. Well, I'm doing it on purpose, doing it on purpose because there's no other opportunity. Because if I think, if I do introvert activity, which is you ask me the question, okay, and then I go silent and I search around in my mind and I construct the right answer and then I go, okay, here's what I've got for you. Well, you've got dead air. <laughs> and you, you know you can't have <laughs> I've had lots that. of interviews like that. So you're right. not going okay. into that category. Okay, so good right. good interviewees yeah. uh, are either naturally extrovert or their propensity is is more towards extrovert. Or All right. So, so but let's let's talk about let's talk about the introvert who is shy. Right. You know, yeah, it's so. you know, yeah. we we're only afraid of uh, uh, of drowning because we we have experienced water, right? So mm -hmm. Um, for the person who begins life, uh, and maybe they're just a, a regular normal person, but because um, they don't really have great social skills and maybe they don't have good body language, people are not reacting to them very well. And so they, they might tell a joke, they might try and share a story, the reaction isn't there. And so more and more and more and more, that information fills the files in the subconscious mind that says, this makes me uncomfortable. And so I start to do it less and less yeah yeah they're not successful at it they're not getting the results that they wanted to right. get and why aren't they they don't have good technique well why don't they have good technique were they not born with the good technique i mean randy you're you're good at this i mean you 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 know this is partly what you what you do you're good at making conversation with people were you born like this? Do you think this is a DNA? Oh no, thing? I was terrified as a as a public speaker before I got into radio. I was just absolutely terrified. So it's a right. muscle. Yeah. So how did you learn? Because this is a learned skill. How did right. you learn? Uh, I, mean, I actually uh, Cole's notes version. I was in sales, and they were forcing me to give presentations in front of uh, larger groups of people, and I was so terrified. I went and forced myself to take a course uh, on public speaking. I, I just I would have I would have been fired. Right, uh, and that led to a career in this, you know, both right. as a speaker and twenty years in the media. So, so whoever whoever you learned from, whatever w was the start of actually some really good learning, because whatever they did with you, whether it was the the atmosphere, the experience, or some tools and techniques, or just repetition, they started you on uh, a a chain, a cascade, which gets you you know, here in front of me now, whereby what 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 it looks to me like is it couldn't be more natural. 
for you. And yet, oh, I was terrible. I was awful in the beginning. Just you know, and the, the, and there were people who who let me be awful for quite some time. <laughs> I mean, right. that's the truth of the matter. And you know, and you uh, you you get you get better over time. So, right. Some of the leaders right. around you don't have your best interests in mind. Right. They will let you. They will let you fail. So, what, what, you know, I love to be able to give people, you know, things that they can take away and they can they can apply. So, um, so much of this applies to personal, but or to business rather. But on a personal level, somebody is sitting there and they're going, "Yeah, you know what? This all sounds good, and I sure would like to be able to stand in a group of people and uh, and do better and not feel so uncomfortable and shy." Give them a couple of you know pointers of uh, perhaps how what they can do and how they can approach this. Okay, here's what I want you to do. If, if you feel that standing in a group and getting into a conversation is risky, you are right, it is risky. It is risky. So that part of your brain that goes, uh-oh, uh, we're in trouble here. We don't know what's going to happen. Will they like us? Will they not like us? Will I say a good thing? Will I say a bad thing? It's only trying to help you. It's only trying to help you, but it's catastrophizing. It's going a bit too far. Don't try and tell it it's wrong. It's trying to help you accept those feelings that are coming, okay? But here's what I want you to do, is I want you to do more body language, purposely do more stuff with your body, which is the kind of thing you do in front of a warm fire, okay? If you come in from a cold day, especially if you're from Canada, you come in from a cold day and you get in front of that fire, what's your body going to do? to get heat and to accept the heat and to love the heat. Well, you're going to do more open body language. But I don't know what open body language looks like for you, but you do because you know what it looks like when you're trying to bring the heat into you. All I want you to do is look at everybody else that you're talking to and just think to yourself, yeah, this is a warm fire, warm fire, warm fire, warm fire. And just do that behavior. Trust me, do that behavior wow. and see what happens. Just see what happens. Even, Amazing. Even the that. visual is perfect because right. now I will remember that. I'll see everyone as logs on the fire. Beautiful. Right? So that's... Beautiful. Yeah. And there's nothing better in Canada than a log on the fire, is there? <laughs> For only about seven months of the year. <laughs> right. right? So, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not that bad. <laughs> you have, you know, it, it, again, it's so interesting to rewind the tape and go back through the story and... Uh, and everything else, but you got to the point where you became so fascinated by this. You know, it's one thing to study and to learn a craft, and then you know, take the sum total of everything you've learned and try and make it your own. But you created something called Gesture Plane. Um, talk, talk about that and how that came to fruition and what it is. Yeah. So, uh, so here's what I noticed is the horizontal height at which somebody holds their hands when they're gesturing has a profound effect on the audience's thoughts and feelings about the meaning of what they're saying. Yeah. So, um, so let me give you an example of, of that. And, you know, if you're able to see this, you'll be able to see it. And if you're just listening to this, you'll be able to hear the change in the tone of my voice as yeah. well. But if I put my hands at exactly navel height here, yeah, and I say, last year, the company made $5 million in profit, which is a fantastic amount. I'm really pleased about that. Yeah. How do you think and feel about that $5 million? Now, if I take my hands up to chest height, yeah, and do open palm gestures and say, last year, the company made $5 million in profit, which is a fantastic amount. I'm really pleased about that. Same number. But my guess is you have a wholly different feeling about that $5 million. You're evaluating the $5 million in a different way. Let me take my hands up to mouth height and do open palm gestures there. Last year, the company made $5 million in profit, which is a fantastic amount. I'm really pleased about that. Same $5 million audited by exactly the same company. Yeah. Same message to the shareholders. Okay or the market, I'm just putting it at different horizontal heights. Now, what if I just drop my hands out of sight so you can't even see them? Last year, the company made $5 million in profit, which is a fantastic amount. I'm really pleased about that. Same $5 million, same yeah. order, same market, okay? Now, wow. now imagine if, if, let's just take two of those. There's the hands out of sight. Last year, the company made $5 million in profit, which is a fantastic amount. I'm really pleased about that. And there's the hands at navel height and open palms. Last year, the company made $5 million in profit, which is a fantastic amount. I'm really pleased about that. 
Now, what if you were to go and report on those two messages to your office and go, here's what Mark was saying about the $5 million. Would one of your reports be more buoyant, be more optimistic than the other? Would one of them be more pessimistic than the other? I guarantee that I bias the majority of people by deciding exactly where the, the, the horizontal height of the hands is when a message is delivered. I can fundamentally bias their assessment of a finite number. It was interesting in watching you go through that and do that because I didn't, I wasn't really aware from the outset what you were going to be doing. And then, you know, again, especially the static hands down at your sides, um, the verbal processing had to come from just taking in the words uh, and trying to disseminate what I thought of the of the message. But when you yeah. were, you know, hands down at your navel, it, it was, it, it just, I don't know, it it made you it made you believable. It made you engaged in, you were really caring and you, you believed, I, I, I saw that you believed the message. Right. I, the, yeah. the, 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 the math is untrue. Okay. I'm making up those numbers. Right. Okay. Yet you told me that I'm believable and I believed internally. I know Amazing. I'm making up that number. You're doing what's called theory of mind. You believe and you project your belief onto me. It doesn't matter what I believe. It matters what you believe, because I am in your head right now. I'm, a, I'm in your imagination. I'm an image in your head, and you make up what you think I am. Now, the problem comes when I think I'm one thing, and you think I'm another thing, right. okay? So we need to get the message aligned. I, I need you to think that, that I am what I want you to think I am. Now, by the way, those, those hands down by the side, the interesting thing about that is I was giving you insufficient data about my hands and your brain is obsessed with my hands. If I give you insufficient data, you default to negatives. So I know you're going to bias towards the negative if I don't uh, show you the hands. So uh, one other uh, element that uh, I just noticed that I, uh, and I, I think just my own personal feeling in looking at this was COVID uh, mm. and masking. I found myself in Canadian Tire one time, you know, it's Canadian Tire. <laughs> I love Canadian Tire and it was full of people and everyone had masks on. And I was, I was in the store and I was shopping for half an hour or so. And by the time I got to the checkout, I started noticing my own feelings and I, and I felt kind of, I felt sad and I felt depressed and I, and I got out of my car later and I thought, What's going on? I mean, why is that? I mean, I love Canadian Tire. I bought some fun things and gadgets and all of that, but I didn't get to see one expression on anyone's face, and I yeah. and I've been missing that. I, it just kind of dawned on me that um, how much of our communication was lost because of COVID. What 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 are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, here's what we know: is that human faces are incredibly important to us all. To see another's complete face for our social mammalian brain is massively important. In fact, you know, Randy, if, if, I, if I incarcerated you and I wanted to punish you for bad behavior within that incarceration so that you wouldn't do it again, the first thing I would do is put you in isolation yeah. so that you can't see other human beings' faces, okay? Because it would depress you massively, yeah? It would alter your life that you would go, I don't want that to happen again. Yeah. And so you'd start to be more compliant uh, around my, you know, how I wanted life to run in the rest of the incarceration. So we know this. We know isolation from other human faces is is incredibly important. Uh, your relationship with other human beings is incredibly important. And so that's why for all of us that have been, you know, masked up during COVID, it's, it's important now as much as possible to to show each other faces and do you, do you think that you know that this is you know i'll allude to why created some scars in people or that they're not if they don't pay attention and they, and they don't work at trying to break out of that that those you know past experiences can can damage them uh, we have you know, some friends in uh, in the child psychology space yeah and their waiting list is you know up to a year 
to try and get an appointment for a child. Uh, And so are are you seeing that what no one, you know, knew going into COVID what, you know, the ramifications and the rest of it were going to be. But do you see that, you know, maybe people that are watching this right now and they kind of feel like they're different post COVID. um, What would what would you tell them about, you know, the science of this and how they can work to kind of come back into the world? Okay, so here's what we know is the brain can change. Okay, so you can, you know, you can get yourself out of this, uh, you know, as quickly as you got yourself in or quicker. Okay, so so it isn't it isn't forever. You can you can change. Here's the thing that we know about, you know, putting that isolating people from those human faces is and society in general. Society is a risk and a reward. Yeah, it's great showing up with you, Randy, because this has been rewarding. But going into it, there was a risk. Like, I don't know, Randy, like, how's it going to be? Is he going to treat me well? Like, is he going to be good at this? It's like, but but what do I do? I go, look, I won't know if there's reward unless I put the risk in in the first place. And if I hadn't done, you know, if I haven't done this for a while, I might go, well, you know what? I haven't done a podcast for a while. So I'm still alive. Maybe I won't show up for for Randy. Maybe I won't do that. I mean, because, well, no, what I have to do is go, I have to risk it. I have to kiss the dice and throw them every time I get into it. Yeah. Yeah. I have to get into it. And, and, and I understand for different people, different neurologies, different upbringings, I get it. For some of us, it's more of a risk than others, but for all of us, we must push our risk level just that little bit more just that little bit more and so i'd say to people look help the people around you support those kids help your friends and family push the boat out just a little bit more each week to help them with the risk of meeting other people again face to face be supportive understand them push just that little bit more week after week excellent one of the uh, uh, just in, in in closing, one of the the things that uh, I've always been very cognizant of is having people on like you, and you know, we go through your bio and we tell your story, and uh, you know, nothing happens in a in a day, and a lifetime has gone into the making of you. Um, and I'm I'm always cognizant of the people that watch this and say, "Oh, I could never be him." Uh, and I, my, my greatest goal is, you know, for everyone, you know, that joins this show and watches the guests that are on, that they are, they are inspired uh, to think that they can create incredible things as you have out of thin air. So I want to make you real for a second. Uh, what would people be surprised at uh, that you said, honestly, oh, I am no good at this? <laughs> what would it be? Oh, I mean, well, look, every every day you, I question myself. Every I don't day, mean body I'm, language. It just means some other aspect of your life that really makes you real. What what is something that you know you you would oh, say? Yeah, I'm not very good at that. I can't drive a car. You can't drive a car. I don't. I can't. I don't. I don't know left from right. I don't. You, I have no. Do you have a driver? Yeah. You isn't that fascinating? Yeah. yeah, I can't. There's no way I can't do it. I can't comprehend, and wow. you know, people are great because they go, "Oh, you know, you, you, you know, do that." And like, <laughs> those are exactly the same to me. I can't yeah. comprehend any difference between those those two symbols for me. I don't know wow. which is the L. I just don't know which is the L. Yeah. So look, you can it. It's all it's all possible. Just keep going. That's <laughs> incredible. Yeah, incredible. This is. Uh... Uh, this has been so rewarding for uh, for me. Uh, it's I have learned so much, and you know, uh, my my hope is that you know this going out over the airways that you know people sit through this and they go, "Wow, th- I've learned something about myself, and I, I can now start to pursue something that you know can make a major change in my life." So I I, I just so appreciate you coming on. If people want to uh, find out more about you they're a politician they're a business owner they own a company whatever how do people uh, get a hold of you really easy just google my name mark bowden and you'll find me All you'll right. find me 
Mate, thank you very much. It, uh, it's uh, it's it's really been a pleasure. I, I I love what I do, but this uh, this last hour has been uh, has been remarkable. Thank you. My pleasure as well. Thanks, Randy. Thanks for a great interview. All right. What a fascinating interview. Uh, until next time, for everyone here at Elevate, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us. Have an amazing day, and be well. <laughs>